en algo de talento. Eh, antes quiero presentarme, soy Sergio Marco, soy responsable en Everis de proyectos de educación y en particular de los programas que impulsamos desde años en fomento de, de vocaciones tecnológicas. Y para mí es un placer poder presentar este seminario, tanto por el tema que toca, obviamente, como muy especialmente por, por el ponente que tenemos hoy, el señor Ian Livingston. Eh, el señor Livingston es, un, es un, todo un referente en, en, en emprendimiento, en la industria del gaming. Fue cofundador de Games Workshop, eh, de la serie de libros de juegos Fighting Fantasy, de las que también es, es coautor. Pionero en la industria del, del videojuego, es actualmente presidente de Playdemic, Midoki y también Playmob. Pero sobre todo me gustaría destacar que el señor Ian Livingston lidera desde hace ya algún tiempo una iniciativa que pretende cambiar y mejorar el paradigma de, de la educación. A través de la excusa, casi yo diría, de la introducción de la programación en el currículum escolar, eh, estamos consiguiendo o se está consiguiendo que realmente los, los jóvenes en Reino Unido principalmente, que es donde el señor Livingston ha impulsado esta iniciativa, estén empezando a trabajar otros aspectos que tradicionalmente en la educación formal no estábamos consiguiendo de alguna forma potenciar. Creatividad, iniciativa, colaboración, etc. Y este es un cambio muy importante, porque realmente si queremos... Eh, si queremos potenciar eh, en este mundo donde la tecnología cada vez está más presente, donde realmente en todos los ámbitos de nuestra vida profesional, personal, la tecnología cada vez está más incorporada, no podemos permitirnos que los, que los ciudadanos y especialmente los jóvenes y los niños que, que, que estamos formando hoy en día se queden en, en un perfil de meramente usuarios y no, toda la no, no aprovechen toda la potencia creativa que realmente la, la tecnología les, les ofrece. Y si queremos potenciar, evidentemente, la economía digital, necesitamos que haya un talento, haya unos profesionales, unas personas que lideren esa economía, que nos permitan alcanzar los objetivos que nos, que nos propongamos en este sentido. Y eso actualmente, desgraciadamente, no está, no está ocurriendo ni, ni en España ni en Europa de manera generalizada. Desde, desde Everis, eh, nosotros observamos este fenómeno desde hace ya unos cuantos años con bastante preocupación, cada vez hay menos jóvenes, cada vez menos niños que se interesan por los estudios y por las profesiones relacionadas en general con el ámbito de ciencia y tecnología, con el STEM, el acrónimo en inglés STEM, de ciencia, tecnología, ingeniería y matemáticas. Y, y de hecho nos, nos ha preocupado tanto porque al final nosotros somos una empresa con muchas otras basada principalmente en el talento, en talento en este caso sobre todo del ámbito tecnológico y está este crecimiento en el interés de los jóvenes por, por este tipo de, de carreras y de profesiones nos impacta de lleno. De hecho, eh, el tema nos ha preocupado tanto que hemos impulsado diversos estudios para analizar realmente qué estaba ocurriendo tanto desde un punto de vista cuantitativo como cualitativo. Solo daros algunos datos como por ejemplo entre, en España entre 2000 y 2010 el ingreso en las nuevas ingenierías, en ingeniería STIC, el nuevo ingreso, cayó hasta un 45%. Y desde entonces no nos hemos prácticamente recuperado. O que, por ejemplo, en este tipo de ingenierías la presencia de chicas no llega a un 10%. Y pese a que surgen iniciativas y se hacen intentos, esto no mejora. Lo cual nos lleva a que nos tengamos que preguntar por qué está ocurriendo esto. Por ese motivo nosotros, como os decía, hicimos ya un estudio hace un par de años sobre una base de casi 5.000 niños de secundaria para entender por qué estaba pasando esto. Y realmente encontramos algunas claves muy interesantes. Dejadme que os, que os destaque dos. La primera, y tiene mucho que ver con lo que el señor Livingston nos contará en breve, es que hay que actuar en edades tempranas. Pensamos que la decisión de voy hacia aquí, voy hacia allá, estudio esto, esto, otro, es algo que ocurre cuando pensamos en la universidad, pero realmente ocurre mucho antes. Y si queremos de alguna forma potenciar esto, hay que actuar en edades tempranas, seguramente ya desde primaria. En segundo lugar... Otro, otro factor que nos llamó poderosamente la atención fue lo que llamamos un, un, un efecto pigmalión muy negativo. Al final, la mayoría de niños y niñas de nuestro país no se sienten capaces de triunfar, de tener éxito en cualquier ámbito profesional o de estudios que tenga que ver con tecnología, con ingeniería, con todo este tipo de, de materias. Creen que es muy complicado, creen que es muy difícil, no se sienten capaces y eso los lleva a entrar en un círculo en el cual ni creen que les guste, ni creen que les interese y entramos en una espiral absolutamente negativa que hay que conseguir romper. Aprender a, a, a programar nos ayuda a, 
a realmente entender cómo funcionan todo este tipo de cosas y si lo conseguimos incorporar de una manera creativa eh, desde edades tempranas, nos va a permitir también romper este efecto pigmarión del que os hablaba. Al final, mediante el aprendizaje de programación en, en edades tempranas, se consigue que los chavales tengan una serie de habilidades relacionadas con el pensamiento acomodacional que son claves para dedicarse a esta industria o en realidad a cualquier otra. Estamos hablando de la capacidad de eh, trabajar en equipo, la capacidad de eh, resolución de problemas, la habilidad comunicativa colaborativa, pero sobre todo el estimular la creatividad y el conseguir que tengan una mayor autoestima, una mayor eh, fe en sus propias posibilidades de triunfar. De hecho, esto es lo que, de alguna forma, está impulsando el cambio que el señor Ian Livingstone eh, está promoviendo a través de la introducción de la programación en el currículum escolar. Y sin más, cedo la palabra a nuestro invitado de hoy. Muchas gracias. Hola, buenos días. And that's about it. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here to talk to you about why I think it's so important that children are given digital making skills to turn them from being consumers of technology to creators of technology. I'm going to talk a little bit about my own life, what got me to this point in lobbying our own government to put computing on the national curriculum and why I think games go beyond entertainment. So we'll start off with a sort of brief um, a uh, retrospective look at my long life in games, some 30 years at Enabai, I think games are important. So I'm afraid all my visuals are over this side, so maybe I should wander over here a little bit. So when we enter this world as children, as babies, we interact with the world, we, we naturally learn through play, through interacting with it. And when we get older, we still enjoy puzzle solving, it gives us a lot of satisfaction. I think puzzles and games help define us as who we are as human beings. And when we attach rules to those puzzles, they become games. Um, I joined the games industry not long after chess was invented in 647 uh, AD and started a company called Games Workshop uh, with two old school friends. The really handsome guy on this side, that's me, back in 1975. And we launched Dungeons and Dragons in, in Europe. Now, Dungeons and Dragons back then didn't look very much, um, the box wasn't very much, but it o opened up the whole world of your imagination. Here was a game where role-playing, by interacting with your fellows, creating theater on the fly, and being heroes and wizards in these fantastic worlds of, of monsters and magic. And um, we went over to the States and signed up all the fledgling games companies. We met Gary Gygax, who is in the white shirts, Uh, and other games designers. The worrying thing about this photo is that the first three people to my right are all dead. And I'm kind of next in line, but uh, let's not worry about that today. Um, we also met Miss Wisconsin, 1976. I don't know what she's doing, but I'm here in Madrid having a lovely time. Thank you. And we came back, um, started selling Dungeons Dragons mail order. Uh, we opened our very first Games Workshop shop in 1978 in, in Hammersmith, West London. I was hoping to do a Abbey Road reunion photo, so I'm trying to contact everybody who was actually in that queue. Um, it might be a bit difficult to do that photograph today because if you go there today, it's the Bosnian Herzegovina Community Advice Center. Um, but I'm sure Photoshop could help us with that. So, Workshop, um, of course, moved away from Dungeons Dragons because that wasn't our product, and we created Warhammer. Three guys at Workshop uh, wrote Warhammer. And what I say to a lot of children when I'm giving talks, and relevant to what I'm talking about later, is that if you own your own intellectual property, you determine your own future and build value in your company. And that's a lesson that I learned way back then and carried it through my digital world with Tomb Raider and, and all the games that we did with IDOS. But today, Games Workshops carried on. Um, it's a powerful company. I'm no longer associated with the company, but it's a publicly quoted company, some 300 stores around the world. Um, Steve Jackson and I took the essence of role-playing and took it into book format um, in the early 80s, uh, creating what was the very first interactive book in which you, the reader, were the hero. Um, these were games books. It was, it was a traditional-looking book, but it was branching narrative with a game system attached to it, and that was the interactivity of it. So it empowered the reader to make the choices 
And that also set me thinking to where I am today about how empowering games and being interactive is for learning as a great learning tool. So it was effectively the gamification of, of literature. Um, there were 17 million copies sold of our books around, uh, around the world. New titles are still coming in. They launched uh, two, two years ago. Uh, Blood of the Zombies in the UK. I'm delighted to say it was published in, in Spain too. Um, say 32 languages. Um, some, sometimes uh, they sold despite some of the covers. Um, strangely, in Japan, um, they wanted to put their own covers on because they knew they they believed they understood the, the, their market better. Um, this is the the Japanese cover for Death Trap Dungeon. You have to make up your own mind about this. It's a very strange one. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make now is that games have never been viewed favorably. Um, our books were criticized enormously despite selling so many um, copies, despite getting a whole generation of children reading. Um, the Evangelical Alliance published an eight-page warning guide about the book saying that if you interacted with ghouls and demons, you're going to be possessed by the devil. Uh, a, a worried housewife in deepest suburbia said that having read one of our books, her son levitated. So everyone thought, oh, for one pound fifty, I can fly, I'll have some of that. And uh, a local vicar threatened to chain himself to the publisher's uh, gates until the books were banned. And you know, as I say, games have never been well written about in the press. Even back in the 1850s, scientific Americans said terrible things about chess, saying people are basically wasting their time thinking about games like chess. And when it comes to video games, the media goes into an apoplectic frenzy when they're talking about games. They seem to judge the whole games industry on the back of one or two titles. And a game like Grand Theft Auto, uh, a great British success story, generated a billion dollars in three days of sales, uh, the largest entertainment franchise in any medium, bigger than any film, any book, any music, was largely criticized in UK press, um, saying it was poisoning children's minds, even though it had an 18 rating, um, like parents shouldn't allow their children to watch 18 rated films, they shouldn't allow their children to play 18 rated games. But no, it was criticized in the press. I got into the video games industry uh, in the early 80s and um, by investment and, and by employment in the, in the 90s uh, when we, uh, a group of us put four companies together and created IDOS and floated on the London Stock Exchange. Our biggest title, of course, was, was Tomb Raider. And getting back to the intellectual property argument, uh, Lara Croft was nothing more than a, a sketch on a piece of paper and went on to become a, you know, a multi-million pound franchise, such as the value of intellectual property. So the games has, industry has moved at an extraordinary rate in a very short time. In, you want to measure it in time, we're still in the 1930s compared to the film industry. And from this simple uh, interactive experience, which is all about the gameplay, not about the graphics, obviously, we now have games that have sort of interactive cinematic experiences, which requires incredible skills to put these, these um, productions together. Groups of 3D artists, 3D programmers, 2D programmers, artificial intelligence, script, narrative, um, physics, model making, uh, camera, just hundreds of different um, skills being housed in, in huge studios around the world making these interactive cinematic um, uh, experiences. Today, of course, there's content diversity. Um, it's great to see uh, people from all cultures and males and females in the production of games. Uh, games are having a, a fantastic cultural impact on the world and it's good to see it's not just about you know, sports or, or war games. So games have moved from a niche to a mainstream audience. Um, children play games. Uh, young people play games, old people like me still play games, and it's good to see everybody is playing games. It really helps define us as who we are as human beings. So mass market entertainment, um, why is that? Well, games on consoles were intimidating in a way to the mass market because it was a 16-button controller. It required an expertise, and along comes Apple with swipe technology and a user interface that anyone can now become a games player by just swiping their finger across the, the, the screen. So now we're living in, in what we could, should call the planet of the, of the apps. Um, two million apps 
uh, right, trying to reach 2 billion people through the world's smallest shop window, which is the App Store. But this is an incredible opportunity because some of these games are generating monumental amounts of, of revenue. Uh, Clash of Clans, um, one of those apps there, free to play, been top of the top grossing chart now for two years. It's generating a million half dollars a day in in-app purchases. Candy Crush Saga generating over a million dollars a day in, in, uh, in, in, in revenue, which is extraordinary. Uh, this is one of the games I'm associated with, blatant uh, promotion here, Plunder Pirates. We launched this two months ago. It's had over four and a half million downloads. This is a small team of nine people in the Midlands and the UK. So this is big business. Um, $100 billion is a fantastic career opportunity, uh, the largest entertainment industry in the world, and yet not many people know about the value of the games industry. But I'm not here to talk about the games industry in terms of its, of its size and its value. I'm here to talk about what good comes out of games industry. On a, if you can park uh, prejudice against one or two titles and think what's happening cognitively when you're playing a game, A, they're interactive, the, uh, a child is engaged, they're having a, a problem-solving uh, experience, games are social, we're playing together, we're interacting with people, uh, which is always fun. Games are cultural. BAFTA now recognizes the art form uh, and awards BAFTA the same way it does for film and television. Games can be motivational, whether it's for rehabilitation or just having children jumping around in front of the television playing Wii. Games are certainly engaging. You can see children really immersed in the experience because it's not a passive experience, it's an interactive experience. Uh, games certainly promote problem solving. Um, children are learning how to solve each problem in the levels of even a game like Angry Birds. They're understanding a little bit about physics as they sort out which trajectory they should use for the uh, birds to knock down those evil piggies. Games are, games are certainly creative. A game like Minecraft, uh, we have to just have to watch any child building this wonderful uh, imaginary worlds on their... <clears throat> various devices and sharing them with their friends. This is like digital Lego. It's a fantastic construction tool. And this is a game. So I'd say, if you think about it, children are, without knowing it, learning vital life skills when they're playing games. They're learning about problem solving, intuitive learning. They can fail in a safe environment and not being punished for making mistakes. They learn by doing, and this is a really important and it stimulates their imagination, there's a community element around it, and even hand-eye coordination. These are all plus factors to my mind. So it's a case of hands-on, minds-on, and I'd like people to think more, in the press in particular, in the same way they think positive things when children are reading a book, that when they're playing a game, they actually might actually be learning something. And perhaps one day we might get a, a, a headline in our national press like this, but perhaps not in my lifetime. So a lot of children enjoy making games. We all like playing games and making games. But how do we move that sort of passion for playing into making games? Well, a lot of blockbusters are being created in the UK. Um, we got off to a pretty good start in games production. But it could have been so much more if people had the right skills to make them. Games also uh, typify the coming together of the arts and sciences. There's, it's a multidisciplinary approach to production. Um, you have to have interactive uh, technology to allow the consumers to take control of the action. You're bringing together story and narrative and technology and art and making this wonderful interactive experience. So this is no mean feat to make a, a big uh, console game. So I think the UK and Spain, of course, as well, are celebrated for their natural creativity due to you know, a long history of the arts and music and, and diverse thinking. But in today's digital world, we have to ensure that our naturally creative people are given the right creative tools to release that creativity as products. And you think about, going back to what I was saying earlier about intellectual property, in the knowledge economy, it's so important that we have these skills. Our governments often think that we must, should be doing more in manufacturing, like and always point the finger at China's economy being built on manufacturing. But you step back from that for a second and think about Apple as an example. If you look on the back of any iPhone, it says, designed by Apple in California, assembled in China. 
the Chinese make approximately uh, $6 from assembling an iPhone, and Apple makes $60 by owning the design and intellectual property. So for an economy, especially the European economy, that is based on knowledge rather than manufacturing, we should make sure that we understand the value of intellectual property and we understand how to make intellectual property, create, retain ownership, and monetize the IP if we want to boost our economies. So uh, I was uh, recently appointed as uh, the government's creative industries champion, and I wrote a, a paper where I said we have to invest 5P in the creative industries, and those 5P stand for perception, pipes, property, pounds, and people. And by that I mean P is for perception. We have to send a, a, a better message um, to government, to parents, to investors, to the media, saying the creative industries are a real important sector. It's not just fluffy industries run by lovers. These are creating real value based on content derived from our, our, our creativity. Uh, as I said, um, games like Candy Crush and, and, and Tomb Raider and Grand Theft Auto are generating enormous amounts of, of revenue. And these are a great career choice and they're great things to invest in. So rather than parents automatically saying, stop playing games, don't think about that as a career choice, go and be a, a banker or, or a or an accountant or a lawyer, I would say, argue, these are really great choices for the knowledge economy in the future. Uh, second P is for pipes. By that, I mean a digital infrastructure. We talk in the UK of, uh, of, of being happy that 4G has been uh, available for, for quite recently. And yet in Korea, they're talking about 5G. They had 4G in 2006. We have to have a a uh, high-speed high infrastructure that allows people to upload content as well as downloading content. And we have to have more pervasive Wi-Fi to enable our, our digital creators to be able to reach global audiences via high-speed broadband. Uh, intellectual property, I won't go over this again, but just to say that we have to go further down the value chain uh, without having to trade it away. So often is the case that people who create IP have to trade away for project finance. They're not able, people with investors don't see the, the value. And often in the UK where we get the BAFTAs, we get the Oscars, we get the plaudits for our creativity, but the money is often banked overseas by people who see greater value in our IP than we do ourselves. Fourth P is for pounds. We have to get the investment community to understand the value of creativity. Um, the trouble with the creativity is that it's an intangible asset. We don't have the bricks and mortar to offer as collateral. We only have our, our knowledge and our ideas. But if the investment community could take more of a, uh, a portfolio approach to what we create, then I think we would all benefit from that. And last but not least, we have to have a skilled work workforce for our digital world. Um, I was chair of Computer Games Skills Council for Creative Skillset back in the UK. Uh, for seven years, and I was complaining all the time there were simply not enough computer programmers of a high enough quality. And I complained to uh, Ed Vasey at length, our culture minister, who's been a great supporter of the creative industries in the games industry in particular. And he tasked Alex Hope and I, Alex is the CEO of uh, Double Negative, the largest visual effects company in, in the UK, to write a review called Next Gen. And if you want to uh, download it, please do from, from nesta.org.uk. And we made a, a number of recommendations to government um, and um, realized as we were going through our, our review that it wasn't just about games and it wasn't just about the creative industries. It was not about using technology. It wasn't about consumption. It was about enabling creativity. It's turning people from being consumers of technology to creative technology was our mantra. And if you read D Douglas Rushkoff's book, uh, do we direct technology or do we let ourselves to be directed by it? We're really at a crossroads. Do you want to be in the passenger seat or do you want to be in the driving suit in, an, in a world which is becoming exponentially reliant on technology? Do we want to be passive users or do we want to be active makers in this fascinating world that we are now totally immersed in? So everything is touched by technology, whether it's a car with 10 million lines of code, um, whether it's fighting cybercrime, if you see what happens in an internet minute, how are we in Europe going to build the next Google, Facebook, and Twitter? And how are we going to have the entrepreneurial skills to be able to scale those businesses in the same way as the Americans do? 
So we looked at the whole talent pipeline. We looked at universities in particular, why less and less uh, people were applying to study computer science at university. And we realized that the main culprit was ICT in schools, information and communication technologies. Um, this was a strange hybrid of off skills. Against all odds, we were boring children to death by the narrowness by which we were teaching them. We were just simply requiring them to do study Excel for a year and then doing an examination about it. These children are digital natives. They can learn Excel and PowerPoint in a week. What we have to do is excite them about creating their own technologies and to think about problem solving, computational thinking, and get them excited about learning about how to understand and operate in the digital world. I'm going to show you now, have a drink of water, a few minutes from the next-gen film we made in support of our review. If I may, just come over here and hit the go button. I think all the special effects are made in America. I think all the big video games we've made in China, Japan. Special effects and things are usually, don't usually do them out of this country, places like New Zealand. Video games are probably made in Silicon Valley around San Francisco. America. China. Japan. America and Japan. America. New Zealand. Japan. San Francisco. <laughs> now I think we've come an age where we can actually be proud of what we're doing because we are creating great content which is culturally, socially and economically important to this country. In a digital age, schools and universities are failing the creative industries. There are a few shining examples of best practice. What we want to try and do with this report is make those shining examples the norm. One such example of best practice is a primary school in Girvan on the west coast of Scotland, where pupils are learning a whole host of creative and technical skills whilst making their very own video games. I made the biker follow a path, but Kodu has to stay off that path so he doesn't bump into the biker. I've made a game with a factory with bikers coming out and then I'm a, I'm a jet and I'm trying to reach that star. This games design project wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for forward-thinking teachers like Avril Denton. I think Kodu is more motivational when teaching a lot of these skills, problem-solving skills, math skills, language skills, it motivates them. Problem-solving, puzzle-solving, choice and consequence, intuitive learning, management, simulations, social aspects and even dexterity. They are a great thing. They're coming here and they're learning how to create games and they can then go home and create games or play their own games. You feel really special that that's your game being played by different people. I would like to make games for people to buy them all over the world. It's opened their eyes really because the children have realised that you know this is a job that they could do and they're, they're starting at a very early level but they could see right I could, I could go on and do this for a living. This is Sackboy. He's a familiar icon of the digital age to millions. He's the star of Little Big Planet, a game which enables anyone to create a world of their own. He sums up the creative power of video games, even for the youngest players. Little Big Planet has been recognised with countless industry awards, including several BAFTAs. Technical director Alex Evans and creative director Mark Healy put their success down to an eclectic mix of artists and programmers working side by side. Traditionally you divide it into code, art and design. We decided that the more people we could hire who 
could do two things in those kind of categories, the better. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you can program, but you're an artist. Yeah. Um, I can't draw, but I wish I could. And so, there isn't really a sense of awareness that you're in different jobs. You, you have slightly different strengths. Alex's path into the games industry was something he pursued off his own back. He believes that if he'd had the opportunity to make the most of his passion in computing at school, it could have transformed his entire educational experience. The partitions between subjects are quite strong, and um, I wish someone had said, yeah, you're allowed to use your computer to write music for your music GCSE. To me as a child, that would have been awesome, because for me, programming and learning graphics and uh, all the stuff I ended up using in my in industry was stuff I did at home, away from school. Secondary schools don't seem very aware of this kind of thing at all. I mean. I think they're very like, you go and do English, you go and do history, like quite kind of traditional. It would have been helpful if I'd known that I could have taken my hobby to a different level at that point. I think they need to understand that you can do art and technical and be successful at the same time. What we would love to see is more people understanding that that means that from the very earliest stage of education, art and sciences go together. Group learning goes with that because that's part of how we work in industry. What we're trying to achieve with this report is to create a culture where that is understood, encouraged and incentivized right the way across the education system. An educational establishment steeped in tradition, Merchant Taylor's Independent School for Boys is famous for its high academic standards in subjects like classics and history. But the school recognises the importance of teaching programming to meet the needs of careers of the 21st century. We have many children for whom computing is a passion, it's a hobby, it's as relevant to today's children as stamp collecting or chess was to a previous generation. If you look at the applications that have conquered the world in the last decade, Google, Facebook, Twitter, They've come from the combination of computer programming skills with creativity. It's by turning out children with that sort of versatility, rooted in traditional academic values, but who are applying those values in a new, technologically-based society. But as Kim Blake from... Uh, if you want to watch the rest of that, um, that video, again, go to the Nesta website where you can watch uh, the whole 15 minutes. So our main recommendation was to put computer science on the school's national curriculum as an essential discipline um, because this was nothing new. In the 1980s, the BBC Micro was a cornerstone of computing in schools in the UK and at home, everyone had a Sinclair Spectrum, an affordable, programmable computer. And that gave rise to industries like the games industry in the UK starting off life because people were actually programming, they were creating, not just consuming technology. So was NextGen going to become another dust collector being commissioned by Ed Vasey from the Department for Culture, Media and Sport? What we needed to do was to get the people inside the Department of Education to understand what we were trying to say. So at first we had pushback from the DfE, so I formed the NextGen Skills Coalition, uh, funded by UKI, the Trade Association for Games in the UK, and we got some big hitters on board to speak to government with one voice, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, for example. And um, we also were delighted when Eric Schmidt, chairman of Google, referenced NextGen in his Matt Taggart lecture, saying that he was flabbergasted that computer science is not taught as standard in, in UK schools. And of course, if Eric said it, it must be true. And our prime minister echoed his words a month later in Tech City, saying, Eric's right, we're not doing enough to support computer science in the classroom. And that opened the doors to um, Secretary of State Michael Gove at the time, who we met and uh, convinced that we were teaching children effectively how to read, but not how to write. And we had to have computing on the curriculum, not just ICT, which was effectively digital literacy. We needed digital creativity. So we're, here we are today. Uh, England um, is now the first country in the world where Computer science will be put onto the curriculum. Computing is the new subject. It was launched in September this year, both for primary and for secondary schools. But getting it on the curriculum is really just the starting point. We have an opportunity to go to the moon with this. The rest of the world is looking on with envy and awe and uh, wondering what's going to happen next. Uh, we now have to make sure that this curriculum is not left to gather dust and that children are inspired to be innovators of the 21st century. 
So who's going to meet this challenge? Well, the Department of Education have stepped back. They don't feel able, quite rightly, to uh, uh, put a top-down view of how education should be taught relating to computer science. It's up to us as industry, uh, as software professionals and universities and independent organizations and informal games and, and coding clubs to make this happen, to start things off. What I do know is that, from my own experience at school, the only thing that often interferes with my learning, as Einstein said, is his education. So we have to change the whole way of thinking, I would say, moving away from a broadcast model of education to a more inclusive, collaborative way of working together, because that is how we work in the workplace, it's by through collaboration. Uh, today's children are totally different from the children pre the internet. Any child born into the internet is naturally connected with their, with, their, with their peers and their fellows. They share everything from their privacy to their creativity to their knowledge, everything. They naturally collaborate. And yet they're still required in many ways to, in school to operate in individual silos when they get to secondary, uh, which goes against their natural way of, 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 of being. And if you look at any, this survey was done about what children wanted at, at, for Christmas. Um, they all wanted you know, devices like iPads and iPhones. And theirs is a world where they multitask. They get fidgety in class when they're being talked at by a teacher who is restricting them with the knowledge that they have and not allowing them to go beyond the classroom, not allowed to, to um, go beyond and, and learn what the world has to offer, being limited by what the teacher knows. They're able to multitask and do amazing things that we just don't quite understand yet. And so for me, an idea of a school should be a, a collaborative environment with peer-to-peer -peer learning, sharing knowledge, which children of today happily do so. And that's very um, visible in, also in the games industry where a lot of shared information, shared technologies. Um, it's less um, is isolate less isolation. So what is computer science? You know, we've campaigned to get computer science on the curriculum. Um, it is a study of, 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 of information, of computational thinking, uh, algorithmic thinking, logic, learning by doing. It's a hands-on approach to, to making things do stuff, uh, of problem solving. I would argue that computer science is the new Latin. Latin underpinned the analog world with the we're getting people to think. I would say computer science is new Latin because it underpins the digital world in which we now find ourselves. Computer science is a discipline. It's not just about the hardware. We think about sorting out our technology needs in class by putting in iPads or putting in more computers. These are just tools. Uh, as, as Mr. Dijkstra says here, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy. It's about telescopes. It's how, what we use these, these things to do to become computer scientists. And it's not all about coding. You know, coding is one part of, of computer science. It's getting, it's problem solving and, and writing algorithms. This wonderful film and book uh, about this poor guy with his locked-in syndrome could only communicate through blinking. He was able to write his own book by creating his own code, by optimizing the alphabet so he could communicate with his transcriber and wrote this incredible book. They optimized the alphabet in the most efficient way so he didn't have to blink 20 times to represent an S. And that is the algorithm that evolved to be optimizing the language. You can use coding in, in grammar. Um, there's a million ways of a way computer science and learning by doing and problem solving can be used in a creative sense in the classroom. The important thing is we have to get children to make them to do stuff, to build up a portfolio, as that child said in the film, of which they can feel proud of. As soon as they're creating something, they get a sense of pride. They're not being fidgety in class. They're absolutely engaged. And the problem people thrown at me at the moment is who's going to teach the teachers? Well, if the teachers can get over their own ego problem, having to stand and, and control, be control freaks, let them facilitate a group learning experience. There's always going to be a child who knows more about computing than they do. And in South Korea, we have examples of the, ch the child leading a group learning experience with the teachers learning alongside them, which is great. And there's incredible resources beyond the classroom, all free. You can go to the Khan Academy, you can go to code.org, you can understand about how coding works in one hour. Obviously, you're not going to become a coder in one hour, but you understand the value of code. 
And not everybody is going to become a computer scientist. Not everyone is going to become a coder. But we have to allow everyone to have the opportunity to be so, so they can at least understand the power of code and its value and how it works in the digital world. Um, education, as Richard Riley said, is preparing children for jobs that don't yet exist. And I think that's our duty to do that, to give them the skills for future employment rather than give them skills for a world that's quickly disappearing. And education shouldn't be about just memorizing facts. It should be teaching children to think, as Einstein says. There's incredible amounts of data available at a click of the button through Google. And we don't have to cram our own hard drives with knowledge with, and dates, for example, in history. It's, it's the context that children need to learn. So much of education is, to my place, upside down. We need to have children become great problem solvers. Knowledge, of course, is important. They have to commit to memory, literacy, and numeracy to get a greater understanding of, of these basic um, skills. But know-how, you know, the, the, the problem-solving aspect of, of learning is, for me, equal. Children have to become great, great communicators. If you're a problem solver and a communicator, you're able to operate. And collaboration, as, as Ken Robinson says, is not cheating. It's how we actually work in the workplace. And we should not ignore that. Not of all of us are academics. In the UK, the DfE wants to try and get children learning Shakespeare even earlier in, in life. If you want to put children off reading for life, keep doing that. What they have to do is to enjoy reading in the first place. And the interactive books I wrote in the 80s got a whole generation of children reading because they enjoyed reading. And then they went on to appreciate Shakespeare. Um, David Putnam, Lord David Putnam, has made incredible films. He said that he got into films because he enjoyed reading uh, comics. Not all of us, again, are academics. The way we teach maths, we have to look at that. We focus in class on the computational bits. This is, for those who don't know, a quadratic equation. Hands up anybody who can do one. Exactly. But in class, we used to do them. We, we, would, we were, somehow figured out how we could do these things. We have these devices, they're called smartphones. They can do the computational bit. What children need to understand is how, when, and why to use a quadratic equation. It's the context. These equations just hang in space without any attachment to the real world. And that's fine for the academics who can think in, a, in an abstract way. But for the other 95% of us, we need to understand why and where and when for these. So the whole way we teach, I think, needs to be turned into a more uh, authentic education, which children understand. It's no wonder they're so disaffected in, in, in school. We have to ensure that play, because play is natural, play is engaging, play allows for failure, play allows for learning. But sometimes we think that play has no relevance because they're enjoying themselves. There's no reason why learning should not be fun in my mind. And we shouldn't punish children relentlessly for making mistakes. You know, so failure is just success work in progress. They learn from their mistakes. And we are all different. And let's not do standardized testing in schools. You know, together we can do great things. You know, if the exam for this guy was to push the tree down, of course, the elephant wins. You know, it's a bit of a lottery about exams, but together we can do fantastic things. And let's not forget, STEM subjects, very important, vital, science, technology, engineering, and maths, of course they are. But let's never forget the contribution that the arts, music, drama, design makes in diverse thinking, in self-determination, and self-expression, the very raw materials of the creative industries. And STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and maths, creates this wonder from which great ideas and intellectual property can come from. So, last I'd like to just finish off saying that a digital education is important because any child, no matter what disadvantaged background they come from, could or might become the next Mark Zuckerberg. The traditional gatekeepers in the analog world are no longer there. Children are able to create their own content and serve it to audiences around the world via high, super high-speed broadband. There aren't many jobs out there, but we can give our children the skills to become their own job makers and determine their own lives going forward, and I wish them well. Gracias.
Thank you very much, Ian. Eh, tenemos algo de tiempo todavía para algunas preguntas. Si alguien se anima. Bueno, mientras tanto, como veo que el público está tímido, me lanzo yo. But the problem now, of course, is who's going to teach the teachers um, who, what, because they don't know what they don't know at the moment. So that's our, our mission now, is to make sure that the curriculum is, is a useful curriculum. It gives them the skills that we need. It just doesn't become another dry academic science with a written test at the end of it. You know, who invented the World Wide Web should not be the question put in the, in, in the examination. It's show me what you can do and create and I can give you a job. If you can have, you can tell me some facts about uh, technology, I'm not sure if you're any, any good or not. So it's making sure that uh, the education uh, people understand what is required by industry. And it also requires industry to work closer with education to have a, a relevant and authentic experience at school. So have you do anything in that sense so that the industry gets closer to education? Is that easy also to, to shift? Well, it, it takes, it takes um, willingness on both sides it could because you know, there has to be something for both of them. Um, it's happened quite a lot in, in the games industry. There's a lot of uh, game studios who are now um, working closely with some universities because they effectively make the courses relevant, telling what's happening in, 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 the, in the industrial world. And of course, they're getting to see the, the, the game studios are getting a sort of free look, look at uh, all the talent coming through their courses. So there's, a, there's benefits for both. But it has to be go beyond games industry. It has to be all creative industries. It has to be all industries. I think it's, 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 it's we can't just have you know, a sort of an academic uh, learning for everybody. There has to be more vocational learning because we have to start creating jobs. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Gracias por la ponencia. Quería, yo ya tengo mis años y, y quería, siempre en la educación se dice que hay que enseñar algo para que la sociedad evolucione, ¿sí? En unos años era la ecología, eh, la informática, el ajedrez, por ejemplo yo soy, mi tema es el, el ajedrez, tengo un juego inventado de ajedrez. Entonces, el ajedrez dicen que eh, mejora las capacidades de las personas, ¿no? de manera transversal hacia todas las, hacia todas las áreas, eh, socialmente y, y personalmente. ¿no? Cuando una persona juega ajedrez. Y mi pregunta es, por ejemplo, en el, en el Parlamento Europeo se ha, se ha aprobado el, el, el ajedrez como materia curricular ¿sí? para los países de la Unión Europea. ¿Cómo se...? Aquí, en, como mi tema es el ajedrez, el juego, o sea, yo quisiera poder llegar a un, a un mercado donde tengo un, la educación de los colegios, donde o sea, van a consumir mi, mi, mi producto porque va a estar en los colegios, ¿sí? el ajedrez. ¿Cómo muevo yo ese, esa decisión que ha tomado el Parlamento y que van a pasar seguro años para que realmente llegue? a ser real, como fue en la informática en, en, en Inglaterra, ¿no? Well, I'll try to translate. Uh, well, he, he's talking about the, the, the decision of the European Parliament about including chess also in the curriculum somehow, and well, the, the, the way this, this uh, goes from this decision, from this uh, go governmental decision, since it arrives to the schools, the way it takes, how has has this been done in the computer science, for example? Well, we, with NextGen, made these recommendations. We campaigned hard. We got to meet the special advisors of the Secretary of State for Education and convinced him, Michael Goh, 
that this was going to be for the benefit, not just for the individual, but for the country from a, an economic point of view, as well as a skills point of view. And that he understood the value of, of coding to create jobs and growth in the economy, as well as being giving skills to children to be able to understand the digital world in which they find themselves. You don't want them being isolated, <clears throat> like a lot of us born in the analog world are isolated from the digital world. So he understand that, that value. So after that, it was a very quick process. Um, computing at school, British Computer Society, and others were tasked with creating the curriculum by the Department for Education. Um, and that happened within a year. And then it was announced, and um, you know, it's happening. Now, there's going to be lots of mistakes. There's going to be lots of people who view computer science as not being important. Um, but we can't afford not to do this. So I'm just very happy that it's happening, and we just kind of deal with the problems as they come along. Uh, yes, good morning. Um, I was absolutely delighted to see in your presentation the phrase, uh, code is the new Latin, because I actually said that to some colleagues of mine over lunch yesterday, so I'm glad we agree on that. Um, I also tell kids that code is another medium, like a camera, like paint, like to be used for creativity. So again, we agree there. What I'm interested in is, I'm surprised actually that in, a, in the UK, uh, where the education system is generally seen to be fairly progressive and fairly liberal, that you that you're still finding that it's very much siloed. And I just wonder what you feel is the real key to change in an education system like Spain's, which is highly siloed and highly memoristic and completely unidirectional broadcast model. And I wonder what you feel is the key um, to that, because top-down change in Spain has never worked. But the teachers, because of their, um, their training, are unable to implement a bottom-up approach. So I just wonder how you would, yeah. off the top of your head, tackle that. <laughs> well, well, maybe I'm being unfair to the UK because there has been, it's not a, you know, not everybody is teaching children as, as individual silos. There's been, as you quite rightly point out, quite a lot of movement towards collaborative learning and peer-to-peer -peer learning and flip learning and, and uh, learning by doing, but there still resides some old school thinking in, within education. I'm not an expert on what's happening in Spain, and you're now telling me that it's worse here than it is in the UK. All I can say is that whoever decides in Spain about the education should think about how children are going to operate in the digital world, and in a connected world, and therefore they need a connected education. It's just common sense. We can no longer maintain a sort of Victorian broadcast model of education where you're transplanting children who have all the same data input into a factory because the world is totally fragmented now. And companies, whether they're virtual companies or the way we operate and how we distribute content is a fragmented and everything's done through the internet in the main. It's going, as all our industries are disappearing into the internet and we, those children are, have to be connected our business have to be connected and classrooms have to be connected. There might be a case one day where traditional children won't be learning inside four walls of a classroom. Uh, the open university or, or MOOCs or whatever might take over, but it, you cannot afford to ignore what's happening in the world. It's changing at an incredible pace, and the sooner governments understand that, the better. Pues nada más, agradecer mucho a Ian su, su charla y esperemos que, que pronto esto también lo podamos ir contando eh, con respecto a nuestras escuelas y a conseguir este cambio en, en la educación en nuestro país. Muchas gracias a todos.